the panel. Um, so thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, the, the panel today it consists of myself, Christine Riddell, and Dr. Lalanath De Silva from the Independent Redress Mechanism of the Green Climate Fund. And we're joined also with, by, by Helen Magata, and she's from Teb Teba, an indigenous people's organization um, based in uh, the Philippines. And we're gonna be doing a joint presentation today on, on how to access remedy um, for harm caused from adaptation products, projects, sorry. <laughs> products. Um, so to speak, I think we can go to, to the first slide. And uh, feel free everyone to use the chat to introduce yourselves and say hello or ask questions. I think between Helen, Lalanath and myself, we can, um, when we're not speaking, we can be answering some questions in the chat. And we'll also have a lot of Q&A time at the end. Um, our plan today is uh, to spend 30 minutes, um, roughly 30 minutes speaking about the, the independent redress mechanism or from our perspective, and then 30 minutes uh, from Helen at Teb Teba's perspective and then have 30 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, so plenty of time to discuss um, Q&A um, after the presentations. We also have some polling questions, uh, which we'll put up on the screen, um, just to, to check the temperature, to see what you think about what we're saying um, and to get some ideas. So to uh, speak, so I think if you can enter the presentation mode. Yes, and uh, yeah. And then shall I just put it into the full screen? Yes, please. Yeah. Can you see it now properly? Yes. All right. Um, so to speak, I think I'll just say next slide. Uh, each time the slide needs to be moved. So yeah, we can okay. start with uh, next slide, please. All right. So just a couple of housekeeping. We were asked to give some housekeeping rules uh, before getting going on our presentation. Um, so as Tasvik mentioned, this meeting is being recorded um, and it may be made available later on on the IIED's website. Uh, so just to note that it is being recorded. Uh, there have been some uh, security precautions taken to discourage uninvited participants. Um, so you would have received your secure link um, and that's how you are in the room today. Um, please do not share this link with anybody on social media. Um, it's, it's a link specifically for you to participate. Uh, we also have, um, we, we also ask that you close all non-essential applications on your devices so that it's not distracting during the, during the meeting. Uh, so things like Skype or, or other applications. And then, as I said, um, feel free to use the chat to message, uh, both, both substantively if you wanna chat about any, any things and those not presenting can answer your questions. But then also, if you're having any technical difficulties, please use the chat to speak up. Next slide, please. So just a quick, um, in case people are not familiar with, with the Zoom platform that we're using today for this conference, um, or the, that's being used throughout the CBA 14 conference. Um, just a quick recap, because I'm sure a lot of you have been in other sessions, um, given, given the time in the week. But um, th there's a button to the left of your screen um, for muting and, and unmuting. So you would have been muted as you entered the room. But if you want to ask questions um, when we get to particularly the Q&A session, then you just unmute yourself in, in, the, in the left hand corner um, to activate your microphone. Uh, you could, we also encourage you to share your, your video with us, particularly when we're engaging in questions. But if you're experiencing any technical difficulties or your bandwidth is low, then turning off your camera can help to, to better your, um, uh, your internet connection. Uh, you can click on participants. So there's an icon for participants and you can see now there's already 26 participants in the room, which is great. We're glad that you've all joined us. Um, you can click on that icon and it'll open up a panel on the right of the screen where you can interact uh, with, with participants. So you can send private messages to, to participants. Uh, there's also a chat function. Um, so you click that, that chat icon in order to be able to, to open up the chat. And then there's a, reactions, um, there's a reactions button where you can click like and dislike um, if you want to show some emotion during our presentation, some virtual emotion. Um, next slide, please. So with that, we'll go into our poll questions. Um, so can we please have the, the polls up on the screen? So 
So we just thought we'd check the temperature a little bit before getting going with, with our presentation. So our first question for everyone in the room today is, do you know what a grievance redress mechanism is? Have you ever heard of one before? Um, then are you familiar with the Green Climate Fund? As I said, Lalanith and myself are from the independent redress mechanism at the Green Climate Fund. And then for those of you who are familiar with the Green Climate Fund, do you know that it has its own grievance mechanism called the independent redress mechanism? Um, and then lastly, what should project affected people do when they face adverse impacts from climate adaptation projects? Should they call the police, sue the project implementing entity, contact the grievance redress mechanism of the project implementing entity, or do not take any action since all climate adaptation projects are good? So we'll just give a, um, a minute or two to answer these questions. And they're anonymous, by the way, so, so feel free to, to, to open up. So another 30 seconds, uh, I think there's six people who haven't voted, um, but, but maybe let's just give it a, a little bit longer and then we'll, we'll cut it. Okay, great. I think we can end it there. Okay, so we asked, do you know what a grievance redress mechanism is? So we have quite an even split um, and, it's, and it's perfectly fine if you've never heard of one before. Um, that's part of, of coming today and sharing a skill. Uh, so we have six people who know what it is, another six who've heard about it but don't know much about it and then eight people who have never heard of a grievance redress mechanism before. Are you familiar with the Green Climate Fund? Okay, so, so more people are familiar with the Green Climate Fund, which is interesting. So 14 people know about the Green Climate Fund, um, and then some know a bit, and then two have not heard of the Green Climate Fund before. Uh, Christine, we, we are not seeing the poll on the screen. Can you please share with, with us? Uh, I'm so sorry. So we, we've actually ended the, the poll. Um, uh, I, I can I, share. I can you, share. You want to reshare it? Okay. Yeah, I can share. Great. Okay, we can, we can open it up again. There we go. No, I'm asking for the result. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got oh, the it. results. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, there we go. Yes, thanks. Thanks so much. Yes, okay. And then, uh, so the question was about the Green Climate Fund. So there's quite a lot of you who know about the Green Climate Fund, uh, which is great as four people only a bit and two no's. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Green Climate Fund, do any of you know about the grievance redress mechanism? Um, so only three yeses, so, so, so quite a low number. Uh, seven have heard about it, but don't know much about it. And then 10 don't know anything about it. Um, and then what should project affected people do when they face adverse impacts from climate adaptation projects? So we said call the police, sue the project implementing entity, contact the grievance redress mechanism, or do not take any action since all climate adaptation projects are good. Uh, so yeah, there, there, there wasn't really um, a right or wrong answer here. I mean, I, I don't think any of us think that, that necessarily all climate change projects are good or, or they generally are, and that's obviously their goal. But, but as, I, as experience has shown, even projects that are intended to do good can sometimes have negative impacts or adverse impacts. Uh, and if they do, then, then people should have recourse to remedies. Um, you can call the police, you can try to sue the project implementing entity. Sometimes there are things like privileges and immunities which prevent you from being able to sue some sorts of institutions. But that, th those are sometimes options. But then what is often an option and which we'll get into more today is that a lot of project implementing um, entities will have a grievance redress mechanism which is there and it's to, um, to provide redress in the case that harm has been caused. 
So we'll end it there. Thanks to everyone for participating in that poll. Um, can we have the next slide, please? And then I'm going to turn it over to the head of the independent redress mechanism, Dr. Lalanis de Silva. Thank you, Christine. Hi, everybody. I'm Lalana de Silva, and I am the current head of the independent redress mechanism of the Green Climate Fund. I've been there for about four years. And let me start by trying to give you a little definition of what we mean by a redress, uh, grievance redress mechanisms. So grievance redress mechanisms, or GRMs, are institutions or instruments or methods and processes by which a resolution to a grievance is sought and provided. So this is a definition that the Asian Development Bank uses and the Center for uh, poverty alleviation, which is a body in Sri Lanka with whom the ADB worked. Uh, this is a definition that they have produced. Now, there are many other definitions, but they pretty much all have uh, a similar idea. So essentially, GRMs are, um, are uh, arrangements by which people who might be affected by a grievance or have a grievance can take it to this mechanism or can take it to this arrangement and then uh, their grievance will be looked into and a remedy found for them. Next slide, please. So one of the earliest grievance mechanisms to be established was in 1993, more than 25 years ago, when the World Bank created what is called the Inspection Panel. I'm sure some of you have heard of the Inspection Panel. Uh, which is also 25 years old. So the inspection panel consisted of three independent members, and sometimes they, it could also have a member from civil society um, or otherwise uh, people who have uh, worked in development uh, for long periods of time and gained expertise. They are appointed by the board of the World Bank and they hold office for five years at a time. So the panel consists of three members, and anybody who is affected by a project of the World Bank could uh, send in a complaint to the World Bank's inspection panel. And if the, if the grievance was, or the complaint was uh, found to be eligible, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, what eligibility means, if it is eligible, then the inspection panel would conduct an investigation and make a recommendation to the World Bank's board as to what might be done. And then the management of the World Bank would come up with a plan as to how to provide remedies for people who might have been affected. So let's say uh, the World Bank funds a dam project. Um, the dam is um, inundating a large extent of land. Indigenous people are displaced, uh, communities are displaced, um, and they are not properly compensated for, their, for the lands that they're losing, nor are they given proper uh, resettlement facilities to go somewhere else. Uh, their lives are disrupted, they could file a complaint with the inspection panel. And the inspection panel by at this time, over the last 25 years, have produced a large number of such, there have been a large number of such complaints. And they have a website, you can go there and take a look at all of the cases that have been done and what, uh, what remedies have been afforded. And so since 1993, almost every other international financial institution, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the uh, Inter-American Development Bank working in Latin America, um, EIB, the uh, European Investment Bank, they've all established uh, grievance mechanisms of their own, also sometimes called accountability mechanisms. Um, and then there are also institutions like our own, the Green Climate Fund, which has established a grievance mechanism. The Adaptation Fund has a grievance redress mechanism. The Global Environment Facility has a grievance mechanism. Uh, and and uh, many, many other institutions. And very interestingly, private sector organizations. So the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank has one. The Deutsche Bank has one. Um, even some sim international civil society organizations like the Conservation International World Wildlife Fund and smaller groups like Profanante in Peru, they have all started establishing grievance mechanisms because it is important because conflict has costs. When there is a conflict in a development project, whether it be adaptation project or, or the other kinds of development projects, those have significant costs and it is much better 
we invest in the grievance mechanism which can solve those costs early. And so many of them, 20 such organizations, love such grievance mechanisms, accountability mechanisms, established what is called IAM Net, the in Independent Accountability Mechanism Network, IAM Net. That was in 2007. There are 20 members, as I said. And then um, in 2011, we had the UN Human Rights Council appoint, uh, you know, the, he was appointed, Dr. Professor Raghi, uh, was appointed as uh, a special rapporteur on business and human rights. And he, after a number of years of work, presented to the Human Rights Council what are now known as the Ruggy Principles. And in it, basically, one of the principles was that people should be entitled to a remedy if they have been harmed. And then he went on to describe some basic principles for these grievance mechanisms. Amongst those principles, the need for transparency. The uh, grievance mechanism should be predictable. The grievance mechanism should be one that is always consulting with stakeholders and so on. There are eight such principles. And then we in the Green Climate Fund established the independent redress mechanism, which, which I said I had, and, and Christine is the registrar and, uh, and case officer. Uh, she is the one who's responsible for taking in all the complaints and, uh, and communicating with and having conversations with complainants and then progressing these uh, complaints. Um, that was in 2013, so we've been in existence for about four years now. And then a very interesting report came out from OHCHR, which is the UN Human Rights um, Body, uh, about these grievance mechanisms. It's an interesting report which deals, uh, which kind of collected a lot of information about these grievance mechanisms across the board and, and have presented them in a very interesting report as to the, what they are, how they operate, and, and how they can be improved. Next slide. <clears throat> Here are uh, just the, all of the different organizations in the IAM net uh, who are part of the IAM net. There you see the ADB, the more recently established um, Asian Investment and Infrastructure Bank, AIIB. Uh, small organizations like the Black Sea and Trade Development Bank, they all have, by the way, grievance mechanism, JICA from Japan, uh, the International Finance Corporation, IFC, which funds uh, much of the, the, the private sector arm of the World Bank. You see UNDP has a mechanism as well, and UNDP is operating and doing many adaptation projects across the world. Uh, the uh, uh, Agence Francaise de Développement, which is the African, which is a French development agency. So you have a number of these organizations, uh, which are very much part of the, uh, of, of the IAM. Next slide. Over to Sorry, you, Chris. Yeah, great. Thanks very much, Lalanath. Um, so as Lalanath mentioned, my name is uh, Christine Riddell and I'm the Registrar and Case Officer at the Independent Redress Mechanism. And I'm responsible at the, the, the initial stages. So if a complaint is submitted, uh, you will be engaging with me initially. Um, so, so I'm very glad to meet you all today. So just a little bit about our mechanism. So as Lalanath has sketched, there are these grievance redress mechanisms or independent accountability mechanism, whichever way you, whichever way you call it, uh, within a lot of international finance institutions. Uh, there's been increasing pressure for, for finance institutions to have these mechanisms. So if you're, if you're looking for, for the mechanism of a particular finance institution, uh, have a look on their website and see if you can find out information about their grievance mechanism. Uh, but today, because we're giving the, the, the presentation, we will take you through um, our procedures in, in a little bit of detail to, to explain how these mechanisms work. Um, but, but we see this more as an example of grievance redress mechanisms, and you can then use that as a skill um, when, when you engage with any financial institution. So in, in general, there, is, there are some good practices amongst grievance mechanisms and similarities in our procedures. We're not all exactly the same. Uh, we've all developed over different um, periods of time and the, uh, some of the newer ones, and, and, and I say that including the independent redress mechanism at the Green Climate Fund, have more progressive procedures um, because we've had the benefit of learning from other mechanisms. Uh, but in general, there is a similarity in the process. So we hope that um, our presentation today will be useful in dealing with any mechanism. Uh, 
So to sketch our position within the Green Climate Fund, so we are part of the Green Climate Fund. Uh, we, we sit within the same office. Um, we, we're, you know, employed. Um, well, th this is this is a, an interesting nuance, but let me get to that in a minute. We are we are independent in that we we are one of three independent units at the at the Green Climate Fund. There's also an independent integrity unit and an independent evaluation unit. Um, and then there is the Secretariat, which is the rest of the GCF. Now, the Secretariat, they have their own executive director and their staff and their budgets and all of that is determined under the, the um, head of the, the, the GCF, under the um, executive director. Whereas the independent units, their heads are appointed by the board of the, of the Green Climate Fund. And the board is made up of um, political appointments um, and it's 12 members from developing countries and 12 members from developed countries. So they are the board and the board appoints the heads of these independent units and then the heads appoint or um, recruit their own staff. So there is this independence in, in how the mechanism is set up. Uh, we do our own budgeting, which gets approved again by the board. Um, and we don't, we, we don't report to the management of the institution or the secretariat, as we call it. Uh, next slide, please. The IRM generally um, has, has five functions. We like to say we have five functions. Um, and I'll sketch these in a little bit of detail. I'm actually going to start with the second one there, complaints and grievances, because this is the most obvious function of a grievance redress mechanism. And it's the function that is common amongst all of those mechanisms that were put up in the slide with all of the logos. So the, the main purpose of a grievance mechanism is to receive complaints about um, projects. So potential harm that has been caused about proje by projects and to try and address those complaints and grievances. So that is a common function of grievance mechanisms. The IRM of the GCF also has a unique function um, and that is reconsideration requests. So, so what is a reconsideration request? Basically, if a uh, accredited entity, so this is again something that you'll understand more if you are familiar with the GCF, but the Green Climate Fund, it doesn't conduct projects on its own in, in countries. Um, it, is a, it is a financial mechanism and it partners with what are called accredited entities, which are entities at the national, regional or international level that have been accredited to do or to implement projects. So those accredited entities will come to the board with their project proposals. And then if their proposals are denied funding, so the board refuses to fund um, those projects, then the, um, then the country involved, so, so we call it the national designated authority. So this is getting a little bit technical, but the, the country, essentially the country involved can say, we would like you to reconsider that denial of funding. And that's something that gets brought to us, to our unit, and we will then make recommendations on whether funding should be reconsidered. So a long explanation for what is essentially a reconsideration request. We also have an advisory function, which is something that is quite common amongst um, grievance redress mechanisms. So we can advise the institution based on lessons that we learn in the cases that we handle. And we also quite uniquely have a function where we can advise based on best international practice as well. So that's to ensure that systemic change happens within the institution. So that we're not just handling cases on a case by case basis, but we're also taking those lessons and those learnings and feeding it back into the institution to make sure that there is positive change over time. We also have a capacity building function. And that's to ensure that there are grievance mechanisms at other levels as well. So as I mentioned, uh, the GCF gives financing or funds to accredited entities. Now these can range from small national um, entities like Lala has mentioned Profanampe, and that comes up in our case example as well. Or it could be large institutions like the World Bank, which is an accredited entity of the Green Climate Fund as well. But each of these accredited entities are required to have their own grievance mechanism. And one of our functions is to make sure that we build the capacity of those grievance mechanisms so that they are able to handle complaints as well. 
So we're really talking about this ecosystem of grievance mechanisms um, and trying to provide as many avenues for recourse for people who are affected by projects. And then lastly, we have an outreach function. So that is essentially what we're doing today um, is ensuring that people know about us. So there's no point in having these mechanisms where people can go and access remedy if they don't know that the mechanisms exist. So very importantly, we conduct outreach to make sure that people know that we exist and how to use us. Next slide, please. Christine, we might have to speed up. Okay, yes, sorry, I just looked at my clock. Um, so, so very quickly, um, I'm going to take you through a typical complaints handling process. And this is uh, similar across different grievance mechanisms. So when a complaint is filed, we would first have to determine whether that complaint is eligible. So is it something which is within our power to consider? There are some things that we can't consider, for example, procurement issues um, or things that are related to fraud and corruption, because those are handled by other units within the GCF. We then have to determine once it's eligible, whether to do a problem solving process or go into compliance review. Now, our problem solving is always offered. Um, it's a more flexible process, really getting to the hearts of the issue without looking strictly at whether there was compliance with the rules um, and regulations affecting the project. Um, if problem solving fails or if the parties don't want to go into problem solving, then we do a compliance review. And that's to check that the, the project actually complied with all of the, the processes that was required to do. Uh, then either an agreement will be reached in problem solving uh, between the parties, or there will be recommendations that flow from a compliance review that will then need to, to be um, agreed to by the board. And then following that process, um, we, we'd have what we call a remedial action plan. So something that addresses the harm, um, and we would then have that implemented by the management of the institution and the IRM would monitor the implementation of that plan. And then eventually we get to the closure of a case. Next slide, please. So the kinds of remedies that we can offer um, are remedies either to redress the harm, so to bring the people into the position that they would have been but for the project. Um, so this could include things like compensation. For example, if people had been resettled as a result of the project, but they hadn't been adequately compensated for that resettlement. That's something that we could, within our power, recommend. Uh, we, we also could um, take measures to bring the project back into compliance. So for example, if a project has not conducted proper consultation, or if a project has failed to get the consent of indigenous people in the area that it's working, uh, we, we can take measures to ensure that those requirements are met. Uh, we can also do things like, um, you know, look into the, to the way that the project is being implemented and make sure that it's, it's being implemented in accordance with its proposal. Um, so these are all measures to bring it back into compliance, which we can recommend. Next slide, please. We also have what's called a suomoto function, which is basically uh, the ability to self-initiate. So we can, um, we can also decide to, to do our own investigation. And that investigation can be done if three criteria are met. So if we receive information from a credible source that there's been an adverse impact from a project. So this isn't a complaint that comes to us formally as a complaint, but if someone sends us a tip off or we see an article on the web or there's a news article that we come across, just some sort of information that is credible and suggests that there's been an adverse impact. Um, and we then think that if that's true, if the information we receive is true, um, there'll be a significant risk to the GCF. Um, and then lastly, um, if we believe that the affected people, so the people who are actually being affected by this harm, are not themselves in a position to submit a complaint. Because we, if, if they are in a position to, to submit a complaint, we don't want to take that agency away from them. It's better if they bring us the complaint and they drive the process. But if we feel that there is just no way that they would be able to submit a complaint um, on their own, then it would qualify for a self-initiated investigation. Next slide, please. 
So this brings us to our case study, um, which Helen um, from Tepteva is here, and she is going to talk in, in quite a bit more detail. Um, but essentially, uh, Helen's organization, Tepteva, together with another organization called Forest People's Program, wrote an article about uh, the very first project funded by the GCF, um, FP001 in Peru. Next slide, please. And this project, uh, as I said, it was in Peru and it's, it had um, many activities. Uh, Helen's again going to speak in, in a little bit more detail about the project, so I won't spend too much time on it um, because I want to make sure we don't overshoot. Um, so this project was about um, strengthening the government's institutional capacity, about creating capacity um, or strengthening capacity for indigenous communities, um, developing sustainable bio businesses, and providing scientific knowledge for managing and protecting the ecosystem. Next slide, please. So Tibteba and the Forest People's Program had written a briefing paper um, on, on what they saw as problems or, or potential concerns with this project. So their concerns were firstly that there had been um, lack of clarity in the funding proposal and in the information that was being put out by the Green Climate Fund and the accredited entity, which is Profanampe about how this project's um, aim of creating um, conservation areas would or wouldn't, would or wouldn't have an impact on the indigenous people's land titling claims. So there are ongoing efforts in this region to, um, to title the land, to get community title over it. And there was no, or from, from their perspective, not a lot of information about how this project and its conservation areas would impact those, those existing processes underway to obtain land titling. There was also, for, um, a, as they set out in the paper, inadequate fr from, from civil society's perspective, um, the, the process to obtain consent from indigenous people, which is a requirement. So it's one of the requirements if you're doing a project in an indigenous people's um, community, that you have to obtain their consent for the, for the project. And there was um, inadequacy of, of um, the methods used um, to obtain that consent, and also the um, whether consent had actually been obtained from from all of the relevant parties. And then lastly, there was an allegation um, or a concern that the project had been miscategorized. So there are different categories of risk, and those categories, when you, when you classify a project according to a certain category, it determines how much assessment or the, the rigorousness of an, an assessment that you have to do. So there was a concern that this project had been classified as the lowest risk when actually it, it should have been classified as a higher risk. Next slide, please. So we um, looked into this case. Uh, we, we agreed that there was credible um, information. Um, and we looked, uh, we, we did a number of interviews. We, we had 15 interviews in total. We did an assessment of the GCF's information. So we looked on the, the portfolio database, looking through old emails, looking through old um, um, communication with the accredited entity. And we set out um, in our report on this matter that we thought there was prima facie. So prima facie really just another way for saying on the face of it. So we didn't do a full blown investigation, but based on what we'd looked at, we thought that there was enough information um, that there that there was um, you know some reasonable suspicion that there were adverse impacts. Um, we also thought that if those adverse impacts were true, that this would pose a risk to the GCF. And we assessed the situation and said that we didn't think that the indigenous people in this community were in a position to themselves complain to us because they were so remote. Um, they spoke their own language. Um, and they were difficult to access, they, they didn't have the technology, um, and we didn't think that there was a reasonable expectation that they could have made a complaint themselves. Um, so even though there are many different ways you can submit a complaint to the, to the IRM, and we tried to make it as easy as possible, we didn't think that they knew about us and, and would be in a position to complain. Next slide, please. So we then um, said to the, the Green Climate Fund, we can either do a full-blown investigation um, or we can set out our findings, make our recommendations, and we can pause 
doing a full-blown investigation on the basis that you agree to follow four actions. So four types of actions that we think is needed in the situation. And the secretariat, so the GCF, they agreed to this. Um, and they agreed on the basis of our recommendations to produce guidance on free prior informed consent requirements. So what is the documentation that's needed to show that free prior informed consent has been obtained? So they agreed to produce more guidance on this. Um, and they also agreed to produce guidance on risk categorization. So how do you classify risk for projects that are involving indigenous people? And those, those pieces of guidance were set out in the operational guidelines on the indigenous people's policy, which Helen will also speak a bit more to. They also agreed that, so, so those two are, are quite systemic um, uh, recommendations and actions that were taken that go to the whole GCF. But specifically on this project, they also agreed to obtain an opinion from an expert in land titling to assess what impact the establishment of the conservation area would have on these land titling efforts. Um, and that opinion has been prepared and it's available on our website. And then they also agreed that um, the, the final process for obtaining consent on the conservation area that that needed to be conducted in line with the, the new guidance that had been issued. So a more rigorous process um, in assessing whether the free prior informed consent has been obtained for this next stage, which hasn't yet been finalized. So we are still monitoring that fourth outcome. Next slide, please. So this is essentially the, the end of, of my presentation because, or mine and Lalana's presentation, because we want to hand it over to Helen from Tepkeba to give more information from her perspective and also um, her use of the grievance mechanism through, through doing this briefing paper. Um, from, from our perspective, we're very happy that the, the Green Climate Fund was, was willing and able to implement these four action items. Um, and we, we thought it was a good outcome to achieve both systemic change for the institution and also change in relation to the particular project. Um, so we view this as, as, a, as a good case of, of cooperation with our institution um, and that we were able to achieve um, an, an outcome that was positive. Um, so before I hand it over, just a quick, um, more of a silly poll question, um, uh, if we can have the poll up. So I hope that this has now changed. Do you now understand what a grievance redress mechanism is? Yes, no, or I know some more, but I'm still a bit confused. Okay, I'm gonna cap it at one minute. So another 15 seconds to respond. Um, mostly yeses I see, um, and some I know more, but I'm still a bit confused, which is absolutely fine. Um, it, it's difficult to, to fully explain grievance redress mechanisms in a short amount of time. All right, if we can uh, share the poll results, please. Thanks. All right, so we have 16 yeses and two, I know a bit more, but I'm still confused or I'm still a bit confused. So thank you very much for, for your interaction and participation and for um, listening to this presentation. Um, and we'll now turn it over to Helen um, from TEPTEBA, who will take, it, uh, take you through the case in a bit more detail and also explain more about the, the agency of, of civil society organizations. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kristin, and uh, thank you, Lalana. Safi, if uh, we can share the uh, PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation, please. Can you see it? Can anybody, everybody see it? Yes, we can see, I can see it.
Okay, so um, I'm Maya Figfikat, Mangkawaya Matsumiu Amin. That's good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone in my um, indigenous language. So before I start my presentation, I'd like to give a brief um, um, introduction of my institution. Um, I work with Tebdaba Foundation, that's the Indigenous Peoples International Center for Policy Research and education. It's an indigenous people's organization based in Northern Philippines. So it was born out of the need for heightened advocacy to have the rights of indigenous peoples respected and protected and uh, fulfilled worldwide. So we are part of a larger network called Elatia. Elatia is a Maasai uh, term that means neighborhood. Uh, this is the Indigenous Peoples Global Partnership on Climate Change, Forest and Sustainable Development. So this network was formed in 2009 through the leadership of the Dabba Foundation and is now currently composed of 19 Indigenous Peoples organizations and networks and NGOs in 13 countries in Africa, Asia and in Latin America. So currently, we also have a small Indigenous Peoples advocacy team that is a task to engage and follow uh, the Green Climate Fund. So next slide, please. So for this session, I'm going to share our experience in relation to the independent redress mechanism in uh, on a particular GCF funded project. So in November 2015 in Zambia, the Green Climate Fund approved the first batch of projects presented by uh, accredited entities. So one project approved by the fund was FP001, which Kristen uh, and Lalanath has already mentioned. It's uh, entitled Building the Resil Resilience of Wetlands in the Province of Datan del Marañón in Peru. It is uh, presented by Profonampe, it's a not-for-profit private entity working for public uh, interest in a country in Peru. So what the project wants to do, wanted to do, was to reduce deforestation and carbon emissions in the region, in that region, and we'll also focus on working with local government and 120 communities, most of which are, most, um, are indigenous. So the project also aims at strengthening protected areas created by the local government, as well as creating new protected areas. So it also includes supporting development of land use plans and um, ecological uh, uh, zoning for the area. And there are some other components dedicated to supporting community enterprises. So it's a cross-cutting project, meaning that it has both adaptation and mitigation components. And um, the mitigation element or component of the project seeks to avoid deforestation and enhance resilience of um, the conservation uh, conservation efforts in the region uh, of an estimated more or less 4,000 hectares of forest uh, and peatlands for over a 10 period of time. Mm, next period, please. Next slide, please. So uh, there was long discussion and deliberation of the board member of the particular project. But despite the long discussions and deliberation, it got adopted with conditions. And I'd like to, I'd like to share with you the conditions in the board meeting. Um, it's a little uh, small in the screen, but I think uh, we are going to share the, the um, uh, uh, slides later on. But I'd like to focus on two of the conditions uh, that include A, that the accredited entity, meaning Profonante, need to clarify which indigenous organizations wish to participate in the project and to obtain clear written consent form from their representative organizations in order to ensure that the project is only implemented in the territories of these indigenous people's organizations that have provided, provided clear consent. That's one of the conditions. And the second, was that the Profonampe to provide an opportunity for participating indigenous peoples to take part in the project design in dialogue with, uh, with them, with accredited entity. So please take note that this project, it's FP001, was the first ever batch of projects in the Green Climate Fund that was adopted by the, by the fund. And so it, uh, sets precedent on how the GCF will handle the next batches of funding proposals then. Next slide, please. 
So the project has raised a lot of questions among indigenous peoples and civil societies um, that, were, that were in the board meeting and even those who are not in the board meeting. So the civil society organizations, for example, raise concerns about the miscategorization of the proposal. In the proposal, it's assessed as category C. And category C for the Green Climate Fund is the lowest risk categorization of project, meaning it has minimal to no impact, social and environmental impacts. And CSOs were, then, were raising this question because um, apparently if you work with or, or uh, because you cannot categorize a project that seeks adaptation in a uh, conservation area as C because then it means it might it might have some uh, social and environmental impacts on on people's livelihoods or people's uh, cultures or people's um, yeah the way of living so meanwhile uh, the initial announcement of the intention of consider considering the project proposal stirred the concerns of various NGOs and uh, indigenous peoples in Peru. Actually, the Inter-Ethnic Association for the Development of Peruvian Rainforest, or IDCEP, sent a letter to the GCEP expre expressing their opposition to the accredited entity as recipient of GCEP funds. In their letter, uh, they highlighted concerns about their negative experience or the negative experience of indigenous peoples working with the entity, including how it only focused on conservation and natural management. Um, additionally, the project area is home to eight, at least eight indigenous peoples, and it's clear that the project has direct implications for their, for their rights to land, resources, and to free prior and informed consent. Uh, all of which are binding obligations of the Peruvian state, um, including inter international agencies such as the GCF, for example. Um, from our reading of the funding proposal, there were things that were also of immediate concerns to us and for our indigenous peoples partners from the region. First, um, it is unclear in the proposal how the creation and consolidation of new protected areas will affect ongoing efforts of indigenous peoples in the region to secure legal recognition of their collective customary lands, um, which, by the way, is a very is well advanced uh, initiative in this in this region. So, these initiatives of indigenous peoples in securing their customary uh, rights to their customary land is nowhere. Uh, you can you cannot read it anywhere in the proposal. It's not there's no information at all. Uh, it is also unclear how the development of state-sponsored uh, zoning of forests will affect indigenous peoples. Uh, we were particularly concerned that the project argues that this management plans or zoning of forests will effectively replace the need for indigenous peoples to secure their tenure rights. But at the same time, it also highlights that these rights will be conditional or continued compliance of indigenous peoples with the conditions um, will, uh, will be established by the project. Um, and as I said earlier, the project wants to reduce deforestation by half over 10 period life cycle of the project. However, um, we noted that there's a low level of deforestation in the, in the region and we raised in the Green Climate Fund that at the funding proposal was unclear where these reductions will be secured. We raised concerns that indigenous people's traditional land use practices and customary uh, resource use may be targeted and there is nowhere in the project document that provides guarantee that indigenous people's rights to resource use will be fully respected and not restricted by the, by the, uh, by the um, project. Um, and last but not the least, we also noted that the description of free prior and informed consent process was very broad in the project proposal. We had no way of checking who were in the meetings, how it happened, uh, when and where all of these uh, meetings or processes uh, happened. There were no details whatsoever. And actually, when we raised the obligation of the entity to ensure the right of indigenous people's communities 
to give or withhold their FPIC or their free prior and informed consent. At that time, the GCF Secretariat stressed that Profonante is an NGO and therefore, according to their interpretation, uh, should not be obliged to respect or conduct the process of FPIC. And, and furthermore, they argued that the entity provided extensive documentation on the consultations that they have carried out in the, in the uh, areas. So next slide. So what did we do? Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the governing ins instrument of the GCF provides that the fund should promote the input and participation of stakeholders, including private sector actors, CSOs, women, and indigenous peoples. So just to let everybody know that there's, a, there's an existing network of uh, CSOs, local communities and indigenous peoples. It's called the Observers of the Green Climate Fund that facilitates collaboration among, um, among them to inform and influence the GCF policy decision-making processes so that the voices of communities and rights holders that are going to be impacted by this uh, GCF funded activities um, will be integrated into the operational modalities of the fund. Um, so we work through a variety of means, including sharing of information, collaboration of analysis of funding proposals and policies. Uh, we also do collective positions and advocacy. And the small team of indigenous peoples is part of this observer network. Um, we only received pro funding proposals uh, two, three weeks prior to board meetings, unless the proposals are assessed as having a high or medium social and environmental risk. Uh, so there was the, then there was not much time to really consult with our partners in the region. But we did reach out and got some information about how some indigenous peoples groups are supportive of the project and some, as I've mentioned already, are, are not supportive of the project. So we prepared the strong CSO intervention in the board meeting in Zambia, citing that clear lack of proper understanding by the GCF secretariat of the operative uh, implications of the implementation of FPIC. We also raised about the, about the entity's capacity to fully implement, implement GCF requirements on grievance mechanisms, uh, information, stakeholders, engagement, and all of, uh, all of these necessary safeguards. Um, in particular, to implement environmental and social management plans, as all of these were required by the GCF from an accredited entity. Um, so there was a long back and forth about how GCF policies will be implemented in, the, in this particular proposal and in, in all other proposals that were uh, up for, uh, for adoption that meeting. But what was clear to us during that time was there was no single policy document that points out or guides both the GCF and accredited entities how to conduct consultations or free prior and informed uh, consent processes for that matter. Um, they only, uh, yeah, so then they, the, the GCF only had the interim performance standards of the IFC on indigenous peoples that doesn't even elaborate on free prior and informed consent. So as Christine has already uh, mentioned, Tebtaba together with Forest Peoples Program, we wrote a policy brief right after the board meeting point this, the, pointing this lapse of the Green Climate Fund. So we noted the concerns of indigenous peoples in the policy brief, and that we also noted that uh, the discussions in the board during the, the board meeting was mostly about procedural matters. So, well, uh, while procedural and participatory issues were important for us, a failure to pay proper attention to substantive issues like land, territories, livelihood rights, and in, and uh, uh, participation of indigenous peoples in the initial phase of the GCF, fund, uh, GCF funding proposal might set up a bad precedent and jeopardizes the fund's capacity to respect uh, these standards. And we also pointed out that this presents a huge reputational risk to the very young fund. So FP001 case shows that the GCF needed to develop its own capacity to fully assess and ensure compliance with international human rights standards and obligations relevant to indigenous peoples. Um, we sent this policy brief to the board members, to the GCF secretariat. We met with uh, advisors, 
and we met with the co-chairs of, of the GCF then and raised about the lack of an indigenous people's policy and guidance in the Green Climate Fund. We also met with civil society organizations and other friendly NGOs who were willing to raise the issue of indigenous peoples in and outside the fund. Um, we also met with the, the executive director of Profanampe and other representatives of the accredited entity to clarify our concerns. Um, just please take note that the, while the TOR of the Independent Redress Mechanism of the Green Climate Fund was set up in 2016, 2013, I think it was later on in 2016. 17. 17. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That the TOR was uh, was updated and that the, the team of the IRM was, was uh, composed. In short, back then we didn't have the opportunity to bring out our concerns to the IRM and to uh, of, for this particular project right after the deliberation of the project. So um, next slide, please. Just maybe before I end my presentation, I'd like to share some insights uh, from our experience uh, on this case. So first, um, doing remedies for climate adaptation should be proactive. Um, in this case, our letter or the letter of indigenous peoples, including the policy brief that we wrote, um, was done around the time when the funding proposal was just was being approved by the board. And it would take another two more years before the entity started implementing, the, actually implementing the project. Hence, there was no actual negative impact yet on the ground when we wrote the project. But uh, there were already red flags or potential concerns and impacts of the then upcoming funding proposal. So down the road, four years after, the project would become the first recipient of the self-initiated inquiry of the independent redress mechanism. Mm -hmm. and, and this self-initiated preliminary inquiry of the IRM would then trigger some policy movements and recommendations to the GCF. So remedy should not only look up us at what it can do to correct wrong. It should also seek measures to ensure that uh, harm in the first place should not take place. But I think the highest standard of safeguard mechanism is that remedy mechanism should first and foremost endeavor to do good as is enshrined in many of the GCF policies. Um, only in 2018, in its 19th board meeting, did the Green Climate Fund adopted its own indigenous people's policy. The policy was far reaching, very robust, and contained the elements that would have guided entities and the GCF itself on funding proposals relevant to indigenous peoples. Um, it also spelled out what's, what constitutes free prior informed consent and redress and grievance mechanism. Uh, I'd like to share or quote what the IP policy says about grievance and redress mechanism. First, that the GCF and accredited entities have the responsibility to facilitate resolution of grievances promptly in an accessible, fair, and transparent manner. It should be culturally appropriate, readily accessible, at no cost to the public, and without retribution to the individuals, groups, or communities that raise issue or concern. Um, so indigenous peoples or local communities can bring their grievances in any language or in any form that they're com comfortable with. In our experience, we raise our grievance by writing a policy brief. But um, this should not also preclude the option to use the accountab accountability me mechanisms of the Green Climate Fund, in this case, the IRM, and that of the accredited entities grievance mechanism. Um, so currently, the secretariat, the GCF secretariat, is now finished developing the, the, the guidance for the implementation guideline of the sorry of the indigenous peoples policy. And um, I cannot overemphasize the role and power of civil society organizations, local communities, and indigenous peoples uh, in changing the narratives and influencing policy environment of the fund, changing narratives and mindsets and making the issues of indigenous peoples a permanent uh, concern or a permanent, um, a permanent element of discussions in the Green Climate Fund. Um, 
the role of bridging the gap between the communities and the GCF, the role of giving voice to people or communities who might not be able to reach the fund or the IRM. So the recommendation of the self-initiated inquiry of the IRM have been very, very instrumental and have helped shape the operational guidance of the GCF's own indigenous people's policy, particularly the definition and operationalization of free prior and informed consent. Uh, it also influence ensuing discussions of how the fund should look at risk categorization of proposals to include rights of vulnerable groups, including indigenous peoples. So, um, and this would be my last point. Looking back, it, it has been a long journey from 2015 when FP001 was approved, even with conditions. Um, I have to admit we felt a little helpless maybe and uh, frustrated when I think that was the collective feeling of the indigenous uh, people's ad advocacy team. We didn't know how and where to follow up our, our concerns. But when we were contacted by the IRM almost two years after, and we learned that there was going to be a self-initiated uh, preliminary inquiry, we were thankful that we wrote the policy brief and that we received a huge backup from CSOs and other support NGOs because then we, know, we knew our concerns did not fall on deaf ears after all. So for young institutions such as uh, GCF, there's so much to learn from other institutions and equally important, if not more important, there's so much to learn from other stakeholders, from countries and, and, and from the ground. And uh, so lastly, of course, it would be ideal if the IRM does not hear from us at all, uh, at all, or at least does not hear of any grievance mechanisms from, from us at all. But as the GCF has started dispersing um, funds for developing countries. Projects are also starting to be implemented and along the way, as Kristen has pointed out, maybe things would not turn out as initially proposed or designed, or maybe there are impacts or potential impacts that were not foreseen while designing the projects. And we are all enjoined to be equal stakeholders to reach out to remedies as needed. So let us continue to fulfill our role to be, uh, to be bridged with our communities or voice or uh, gatekeepers as uh, needed. And um, I thank you. I end my presentation here. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Um, so we still have uh, a good 27 minutes for, for, um, for questions and answers. Uh, so we've, we've done good time um, and still lots of time to engage with everyone. Uh, we've seen a number of really interesting uh, questions already on the chat and we've tried to respond to everything, but if there are some questions there that you feel haven't been addressed or haven't been addressed fully, uh, please feel free to raise them now again. Um, and if there's additional questions, we, we still have lots of time. I also really like uh, that there was a question uh, or a comment from Monisha about ways to, to increase the, the independent redress mechanisms visibility. So if anyone has ideas on how we can do better um, in terms of our outreach, we would really love to hear them. Uh, we, we are doing events like this, but not only events like this. This is obviously an event uh, that's not, not necessarily ac accessible to, to, to project affected people. And we try to do in-country um, events as well. Uh, before COVID, we did, we did in-person events um, in regions that, that have uh, GCF projects. This year, we've completely reshifted that and we're doing online events. We've done now one for the Pacific region, one for Brazil. Um, we're doing one for Mongolia next week. And we're also doing the Central Asian region at the end of October. Uh, we try to do those in, in the languages. So next week's Mongolian one is in Mongolian with an interpreter, um, Mongolian presentations. Uh, so, so we're trying to, to do different strategies um, and for our outreach events, we were trying to focus on regions where we think that there is a higher risk. Uh, so we've done a risk assessment and we're trying to, to, to get our name out there in, in regions that we think are more likely to generate complaints. But these are just some ideas and we'd love to hear yours. So let me stop talking so that we can go to questions and answers. So, so please feel free to either type in the chat that you have a question or to raise your hand, um, which you can do if you click on, um, where's the raise your hand function? Why do I not see it now? Participants. Uh, participants. If you open up participants, that's right. Okay. Or Thanks, you can Alan. just ask for the floor for, uh, on the chat. Or you can just ask for the floor on the chat. Uh, so yes, uh, 
24 minutes. Uh, so, so please feel free to jump in with questions. I know that people are not shy because we've had lots of good questions. So someone has to be first to break the ice. Um, Monisha, you've raised your hand. Please go for it. Um, perhaps, um you know, adding to the strategies that you're already using to make this uh, redress mechanism more widely known and accessible, perhaps uh, another strategy could be to partner up with, uh, with a national level institution who have a network uh, throughout any specific country so that uh, it's not like a one-off event that you carry out, but you rather have a partner who is uh, grounded and who knows the reality, who knows uh, what needs to be done and what the best ways are to reach to the communities. Mm. That's what I could think of. I don't know if that's already something that uh, GCF is doing. And that could be um, an independent body besides uh, the, um, the, sorry, I forget the terminology, the, the accredited entity, not the accredited entity, but some other entity. So it's like a third party verification or so that, um, so that uh, communities feel that they can, um, so there's a, there's a trust element to have a third party mm -hmm. around as opposed to going through the accredited entity against whom yeah. they may have grievances. Mm -hmm. Um, can, I, can I jump in here? So I think that's a really great idea, Monisha. We've tried some of that, and I think we should do uh, continue to do them and do them better. So, for example, we might we have partnered with, and we will partner very soon with uh, the with E Law. I don't know if you know about E Law. E Law is the Environmental Law Alliance worldwide, and it is a network of 300 uh, public interest lawyers and scientists working around the world. Uh, we, we are running a workshop with them to let them know about the IRM. Um, we, we've also worked with, uh, you know, we, we can work with, for example, TEPTEBA, which is uh, Helen's group, which has a large number of indigenous groups affiliated to them. Um, another thing that we are thinking about doing is working with federations of indigenous people. For example, there are large federations in Peru, which uh, have mem the membership of you know, hundreds of indigenous people's communities. We can try to run a uh, workshop with those people as well. So they, they are independent of the accredited entities. And I want to put out the word here, if any of you know of such entities or would like to collaborate with us to get the word out to your colleagues, to uh, you know, community-based organizations, do send us an email. Our email address is irm at gcfund.org. I actually put it in the chat. Uh, do send us an email and we'll be happy to try to, shed, uh, to schedule um, uh, an outreach workshop. And an outreach workshop might be just an hour, might be 90 minutes like this. There's a lot of information we can give you just during even a short period of time like that. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to add uh, to, to Lalana's comment, what, what we have also been trying to do is when we, when we do outreach in a particular country or particular region, uh, we've been partnering with local NGOs um, for, for that event specifically. So the one in Mongolia next week, for example, we have three local NGO partners who are putting the workshop on together with us. So they're involved in the planning. They've helped us craft the agenda to try and make it relevant for the region. Uh, make sure that we have people speaking on panels that are not just our, ourselves. Um, so, so that is also something that we've given some thought to. Um, yeah, just to mention that. I see we also have a, a, some questions in the, the, the chat. Um, Alfie, your question, and, and it's seconded by, by Jerry. Um, in Tanzania, very few organizations have accreditation or have accredited for the GCF funding mechanism. Can you extend your outreach program to Tanzania and other least developed countries, particularly in Africa? 
Um, so yes, I mean, uh, GCF is, is definitely doing projects in through, throughout Africa. Um, and there, there is, of course, this difference between what the GCF does and what us as an independent redress mechanism do. Um, so to get accredited, getting accredited and getting funding, that's really part of, of, of the, the kind of the GCF secretariat or management side. Um, there are processes um, that are set out on, on the GCF website for how you can get accredited for funding. And it's not only government institutions um, or large multinational corporations. There is this possibility for smaller organizations to become accredited and get funding. Um, and then in terms of our own uh, outreach in, in Africa, we, we have done some outreach in Africa. We were in Abidjan last year in West Africa. Um, and we were also in Southern Africa at the beginning of this year, but unfortunately we, we went, but, but our event was, was canceled because of COVID. Um, so we've done some online outreach for Southern African um, civil society organizations as well. Uh, but certainly we, we can certainly do more in, in Africa um, because there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of projects in Africa and a lot of, uh, there's certainly a lot of intent from the GCF side to do projects in Africa. Um, Christine, I was just yes. look, looking on the website of the GCF and Tanzania unfortunately doesn't have any GCF funded projects as yet. Interesting. Uh, and um, that's because uh, Tanzanian um, entities and, um, uh, and, and other accredited entities haven't applied to the fund to do projects mm. in the region. Uh, they do have a readiness program, which means uh, the GCF is giving the government money to get ready to apply and get ready mm. with proposals to apply for funding, but uh, none have been funded yet at the moment in Tanzania, but may very soon be funded. I mean, there's uh, the current funding rate is $10 billion, which has to be given away in the next three years. So it is possible that there may be funding proposals coming up in Tanzania. Mm. And I see Rachel as well said that Botswana doesn't have any either. Um, yeah. Um, a large number of countries, I mean, uh, over 60, 65 countries have already got funding and some of them have multiple projects. In Mongolia, there are actually five projects. In my own country, in Sri Lanka, we have two projects. Egypt has a large number of projects. So some countries are better at applying for funds because they've really mastered the art of applying. Others are still not applied at all. But all developing countries, all developing countries, particularly LDCs, uh, these developed countries as well as SIDS, the, the island nations are, um, have, have preference uh, so they, they can e get funds uh, much quicker and easier uh, and other countries, all developing countries are entitled to apply for funding from the GCF for both climate mitigation and adaptation projects. Christine? Yes. Yeah. Perfect, Helen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd just like to also share our, our other, the other things that we are doing uh, in terms of making sure that we, we perform our role in bridging uh, communities' voices to the GCF and to the IRM for this matter. So um, last, we also do uh, regional workshops with our partners where we introduce what the Green Climate Fund is all about and deal uh, or provide sessions on how they do uh, complaints, for example. So we do translation of, of our materials into the two kinds of tra translation uh, into their own language and also translating the materials into more popular forms so it's easier to understand for, for communities. Um, and I think one other thing that we all, we, all of us in this uh, webinar can do is that, uh, and we have, we have actually uh, tried this and it worked, we introduce the IRM to the communities that uh, we work with, and then we just, we just trust that the IRM carries on. So uh, there, there was one project, for example, in Kenya, and we heard of some, uh, some concerns from our partners. So what we did was, because we cannot, we can, I mean, it's not our uh, role to resolve the concerns. So what we did was we introduced our partners to the, to the IRM, and uh, 
and then they took it from there. So I think just just by making this uh, introduction and making uh, making them know that uh, such a mechanism exists and introducing them to the IRM directly is a, is a very very uh, practical and uh, practical step that we can do at the country level. Thanks. Thanks, Helen. Any other questions? Um, I, does that answer your question, Monisha? Um, and Lanlis also responded on the chat as well. Um, yeah, th yes. that, that is true. The, yeah. Alanis, you want That's an interesting it? Con question that Monisha is raising. I mean, who can help these communities to, even if they know about the IRM, I mean, how can they, uh, you know, file a complaint? They may not be able to write. They may not be uh, illiterate. Um, so there are a number of civil society organizations that actually specialize in helping uh, communities and other civil society organizations to file complaints. And, and I've given four names. Their accountability council is one, which also has branch offices in a number of different countries. I know they have an office in India uh, and in other, in also in Africa. And then there is SOMO, which is based in the Netherlands, which also has uh, contact points. Uh, then there is Bank Information Center, which specializes in filing complaints with the, uh, with the World Bank's inspection panel. And then for the Asian region, there is the, a a the N uh, ADB's NGO Forum, which, uh, which files cases. And maybe Helen, I don't know if you know of others. But even uh, Helen's own group, Tepteba, you know, can help you. Um, and, and, and as a last resort, you can always write to the IRM or as a matter of fact, you can also write to people like the inspection panel, whoever the donor agency is concerned, most GRMs, you know, and you don't, uh, you, you can't try to help these communities. The community doesn't need to write a long, you know, complicated legalistic document that is not required. Even a sentence saying, you know, my house was taken away and I have not been paid compensation or I don't know why is enough to trigger a complaint. You know, if we get a complaint like that on our, for, on our web form or um, even on a telephone call, we will then try to get contact details and get in touch with the person, talk to them and see what their complaint is and try to figure out the nature of the complaint. So there is a lot of help out there. Of course, you know, knowing where to go for that help is, 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 the, is the challenge. And also maybe just to add to what Lanlis already said, the IRM is quite unique in that our procedures and guidelines specifically allow us to cover the costs of effective participation in our process. So if a community is unable, uh, I mean, there are no formal costs involved, uh, but we recognize that, that formal costs are not the only kinds of costs. So, you know, if there are costs involved in, in getting to meetings, in um, any kind of engagement that's needed, and that could even extend, we, we haven't had any requests for it, but if, if an advisor is needed to assist a community, that might be something that we could consider is, is necessary for effective participation. So th these are all kinds of things that, that we can test within that um, ability that we have uh, to, to, to pay for effective um, participation. So, for example, we have received complaints. Um, there's an ongoing complaint, for example, from Morocco um, in the size region in which uh, the, uh, the, the allegation is, uh, this is a water project uh, where uh, groundwater is deplete, being depleted in Morocco and the government, I believe, wants to uh, pump water from a dam, a nearby dam, and uh, ask people to stop using the groundwater so that aquifer, aquifer can be recharged. And then there is a complaint there about, you know, people are concerned about how much they'll have to pay for this water. They, they believe that they may not have been properly consulted uh, and given the information they need. So that's, that's a kind of one of the complaints that is ongoing. Uh, another complaint that we received recently from India was uh, some mangroves had been cut in the area in which the Green Climate Fund actually had has a project to protect those uh, uh, those mangroves. Um, that that um, that complaint, unfortunately, we couldn't proceed with simply because the mangroves that have been cut are outside of the project area itself, which is uh, with the GCF project area. It's it's away from it. Uh, 
but if it was within the project area, then that's a, that's a complaint we could definitely have also looked in. So, you know, you can have complaints of different kinds of ways in which people might have been affected. So we still have nine minutes. Uh, so if there are any further questions, please raise your hand or post in the chat. So I think it looks like we've exhausted questions. So you all have our emails. You have, uh, please write in if you have any thoughts or comments or want to make suggestions or actually work with us collaboratively. Happy to receive uh, your emails and we'll then communicate with you. Uh, thank you very much for being, uh, for joining this session. And I hope you'll speak about what you learned to your colleagues uh, and, and spread the word as much as you can, particularly to communities that might be affected not only by Green Climate Fund, but by any other institution that might actually have a grievance mechanism to which they can go. So back to you, Christine, to wind up. Thanks so much. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to say thank you as well to IIED for hosting us. Uh, this has been a really great platform for us to connect with people. Um, I think at, at one point we had over 30. Um, people are, are obviously dropping out now as we end the session, uh, but it's been a really good opportunity to connect um, and I also wanted to really thank Helen Magata from Tepteba for agreeing to, to talk to us, well, with us on the session. Um, it, it's, been, it's been really great um, getting to know Tepteba better over the last couple of years that I've been at, at the IRM. Um, and uh, it's really good to have partners in, in civil society that we can count on to help spread the message um, of the IRM and to work with in relation to complaints or these sort of self-initiated investigations. Um, we call our self-initiated investigations a potential backdoor to the IRM. So the, the complaints are the front door, but then this is another way that, that, um, that grievances can be brought to our attention. Uh, so we really encourage civil society to use that as well. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and it's been really great. Yeah, sure. We will, make, we will make our presentations, both Helen's and ours, available to our, our Yeah, we, yeah. we have shared them with the IID, uh, IIED, um, and we, I, I mean, from our perspective, and I'm sure Helen's the same, although Helen shout if it's not, but um, uh, they are public information, and, and IID, IIED is welcome to share them, um, and, and we hope that you all receive them that way. And if not, email us, and we'd be happy to share them directly with you over email. All right, well, thank you everyone. Have a good day wherever you are in the world, whether it's morning or afternoon or night. And thank you very much. And thanks for all the, the thank yous on the chat. It's much appreciated um, and have a good, have a good night.